time to come and listen to this chat. Um, this is my first Zoom um, presentation, so uh, just go easy on me. <laughs> um, but, so tonight's talk is about edimentals. First of all, to introduce myself, my name is Orla Murphy. I live in Wicklow, down in, um, just outside Dublin. And uh, I have a tiny garden. I, I, I don't think you can probably see it there, but literally it just goes to the back wall. And most of the garden is taken up with this sunroom. And of course, you know, being an avid, avid gardener, I want to cram as many plants into the garden as I possibly can, but I'm also a foodie. So, you know, I need to grow as many plants, as many plants that I can eat in the garden as well. And of course, it just gets muddled and too full when you try to do everything. So a couple of years ago, I came across a chap called Stephen Barstow. And Stephen wrote a book called Around the World in 80, 80 Plants, if you can see that, Stephen Barstow. An incredible guy. He's a, an English chap and he moved to um, Norway when he was in his uh, sort of mid-twenties. And he was a vegetarian, but when he got to, to Norway, he was sort of dismayed by the lack of food and the lack of vegetables that he could eat. So he started his own garden, as you do. And uh, so began a sort of a 30-year love affair of wild, you know, perennial, um, unusual, gorgeous plants that he plants in this garden. Um, he, it's an amazing book. If you want to start off on this sort of journey, this is an incredible book. It really is. It, it reads beautifully. The pictures are lovely. And he's, he's just, he's, he's amazing. He's absolutely amazing. But he coined the term edimentals. And edimentals basically is edible ornamental plants. <coughs> um, so the idea with me then, back to my little small garden, it means that what I could grow in my garden could also be attractive and lovely, but would fit in and would still have that food element, um, uh, you know, for me to eat as well. Um, that has slightly changed now because I have been incredibly lucky and a friend of mine has given me um, a small piece of land up on her, she's got 20 acres. And between the two of us, we are developing our own edimental garden. And our edimental garden is going to sort of showcase all of those amazing plants that I am addicted to buying um, or getting or, you know, propagating or whatever. And I've now got a home for them and I don't have to squish them into my own small tiny garden. So this new edimental garden, it's only very, very young. It's only about three or four months old now at this stage. But we're getting there. We're absolutely getting there. So without further ado, let's... Now, before we start, I just want to tell you, this is an introduction. It's only a little teaser, really, more so than anything else. Um, because this is a huge, huge... I mean, there's so many edible plants, you wouldn't believe it. It's unbelievable. Um, so really just take it that this is just to get you sort of started on it. Um, the other thing, a couple of little caveats. Um, obviously, you know yourself. I mean, nobody's silly, you know, <laughs> these days. But you've got to be sure if you're going out there to eat something um, from your garden or foraging or whatever, you've got to be sure, you've got to use your own intelligence that it is an edible plant and not something else. Because obviously there are humongous amounts of plants out there that will, if anybody reads Agatha Christie, you know she kills them all with wolfbane and which is aconitum and box gloves, um, amazing heart medicine. But if you eat them, you get, you know, that's, that's you done for. Laburnum, you know, the list goes on. There's, there's loads of plants that are dangerous. So just know, double check, um, check the you know reference books. Check the internet. Don't rely on the internet, but do you know? Check you fact check basically. Just check everything. And of course, then the other side to it too is that you know loads of people are are um, uh, you know they're affected by say strawberries. They get rashes. So just be you know when you start on this journey, eat small little bits to start off with, and then see how your body reacts to it. Um, 
And the other last caveat, I promise that's it, and then we'll go into it. But the last caveat, if you buy them, if you buy plants from the garden centers or whatever, most gardens, I'm not saying all gardens, but most garden centers still spray. So let the plant go through a growing season or two before you start eating it. Um, uh, you know, just to be on the safe side, you don't want to be taking in all those awful um, uh, chemicals and whatever. Anyway, that's it. I'm done. That's the, all the caveats. Um, let's get started into it. So the first one I was telling you about Stephen, he is amazing. And if, you, if, you, if I can recommend that book above, above and beyond anything else, get that book. I have a heap of other books that I can go through and show you bits and pieces as well. Mark Diakono, if you know Mark, he's over in Otter Farm, an incredible guy and really loads and loads of information in his books. He has an amazing array of uh, vegetable books. In fact, one of the really good ones, and it's, if you get it on Amazon and it's, you know, it's, it's just a super little book and it's a good one to get started with as well, is Grow and Cook by Mark Diakono. And that goes through, I mean, so many different plants from your traditional, you know, runner beans, but all the way up to things like, um, you know, um, nasturtium marigolds, uh, perillia, parsley sage, loads of different plants, Welsh onions, winter savory, tons and tons of plants. So that's a good one to get as well. But he has a whole heap of different books. Martin Crawford is another guy. Martin is, um, Martin runs the Agroforestry Tr Trust over in Totnes, and he is a forest gardener. Um, the two sorts of crossover, you know, my edimental could be seen as a small forest garden as well as it develops. But Martin is, um, he's an amazing guy, and he has a whole uh, heap of lovely books. Um, including a lot of recipe books that I'll show you as well. And when we start talking about things like, you know, bamboos and, uh, you know, eating salmon seal and stuff like that, it can be, you know, it's all well and good saying you can eat them, but it's nice to have a few recipes to go along, you know, figuring out how you actually cook them, you know, which is great. And Mark, uh, Martin Crawford has a, has a brilliant book about that. Then you have Joy Larkham, you know, the rest of them there, Paul Barney, he's from a, an amazing nursery in England called Edulis. I get loads of plants from Edulis, it's, or at least I covet loads of plants from Edulis. Uh, he has some amazing stuff and he goes off and plant hunting expeditions and you know he could be up the mountains and he always has great stuff and yeah, he's fantastic but you can see there's a whole heap of people in this little small uh, community that sort of champion these these types of plants and a different way of eating. But you know in this whole situation I mean the whole thing about it is that you know, food shortages, uh, the way we're actually farming, the, you know, trying to get food into urban, into cities, all the rest of it. It's, it's, it's getting more and more tighter, you know, the, 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 the whole, the whole area is, is just, it's just, you can just see things need to change. And I mean, if you look at it there, I mean, that's a, a kind of a little thing from the internet saying 3000 edible plant species, that's species, not even variety, species. And we eat about 200 of them. And when you think about it, most of that, really, when you think, is probably rice and grain and uh, tubers, potatoes, whatever, you know. So really, we have a very, very limited, we eat a very, very limited amount of foods compared to what there is actually to eat. Um, but, you know, look at it. I mean, the hook for me is we eat with our eyes you know we we are we're human we you know it's it's texture and taste and all of that is very very important but visually we see it first so i mean that to me imagine a dish full stephen actually stephen was uh, he was coined or he was named um the extreme salad man because uh, oh, I, uh, maybe about eight years ago, he uh, got into the Guinness Book of Records with a salad. Now, wait till I just tell you exactly. 537 different foods or different uh, plants in that salad. 537. I mean, that's ridiculous. I've actually done a salad myself. And I think that I had got to something like maybe, I don't know, 120 types of food in the salad which, you know, I thought was amazing, but he did 537. That is some man, I'll tell you. Um, and of course, you know, nutritionists, uh, um, they, like anybody will tell you now, 
and even God with COVID, I mean, it's become more and more important that our gut is that we look after our gut, you know? And the whole thing is the more foods, the more variety that you eat in your diet, the much better your gut is gonna be. So if we can look at adding a couple of extra little things from our garden into our diet and being that little bit more adventurous, I mean, we're on a winner. Uh, so the next thing, so let's get started then. Edible flowers. Um, I know the edible girls are on, so they will, and, and I know you had the talk already, so well, we'll only do a couple of these, so um, we'll fly through them, but, and I'm sure I'm probably going over the same ground that they did, but let's just quickly go through them. The kind of staples, for me, I have three things. Well, first of all, cornflowers. I mean, cornflowers to me are an amazing plant because um, they're beautiful in a salad. They're beautiful for decorating cakes. They're beautiful, you know, even mixed with um, cream cheese. You know, they're really lovely. But they also dry incredibly well. And that becomes incredibly useful because you can store them for the winter. Um, they make lovely teas. Uh, dried when you, um, if you're making up like a rice dish or uh, couscous or anything like that, if you add the petals into it, it's, it really is attractive and it is quite tasty as well. Nasturtiums, I'm sure everybody at this stage has tried nasturtiums, um, but they're a great plant and they are a value plant. I mean, they're so easy to grow and they bulk up so quickly um, and they're incredibly pretty. And of course, if you grow vegetables, you all know that they are your sacrifice plant in that the white butterfly, you aim to get the white butterfly on those guys rather than on your cabbages. But from our garden point of view, we, I mean, they're so good. They're absolutely brilliant. And there are lovely, I mean, we have our ordinary um, nasturtiums, but they're now loads of different colors, um, variations. Um, uh, there's, um, um, you know, oh, um, beautiful climbers in the, in the group as well. Trapeolum uh, tuberosum is a beautiful one. Um, uh, it's just, there's, they are a super plant to have. And of course you can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers, but you can also eat the seeds. I love the seeds because what I do is I collect the seeds and I do two things really. I ferment them, which is brilliant. That's just adding in a salt solution. Um, it's normally about 2%, 2 or 3% of the, the, you know, the volume of what you're putting into it. Or I pickle them and pickle either or they are beautiful. They, you know there's pros and cons for both but either or they're beautiful and they are so good and um, to be used as you would say capers you know that kind of idea or even just in salads or whatever they're really good and then of course violas or pansies and um, they are just everything from heart seeds the small tiny little ones the little wild ones all the way up to blousy beautiful um violas i have i've a uh, uh, heap of them here in the garden um that are just absolutely gorgeous. And both the leaves and the flowers are edible. And um, the leaves are actually really good for bulking up salads. And then the flowers are incredibly tasty. Um, some, some have a, a, a slight uh, unusual flavor in that, I don't know if anybody, um, maybe not our, our person from Florida, but you thymol toothpaste. Do you know that pink one that you used to get? Um, one, uh, one that I have in the garden, which is a beautiful viola, tastes of you time will toothpaste, which brings me back. <laughs> but they are a great plant. And of course, you know, medicinally, now I am not a herbalist and I do not, you know, I, I would not even claim to have any, you know, um, real knowledge on it. But even just skating around the edges, I know that um, the violas have always been used for anything to do around the heart. So um, whether that's calming or, you know, just beefing up the heart as well. So it's, they're a great one to have and really such a pretty thing. And they bulk up so quickly as well. And they're gorgeous. So they're win-win situation. Calendula, I mean, calendula, marigolds. Oh, love marigolds. And again, with marigolds, these are super, um, you know, just take the, the petals off and put them into your salads or into uh, couscous or rice or, you know, anything that you want at all. Uh, but also, you, they dry beautifully. I have a dehydrator and I'll show you that later on, but a dehydrator, they dry in the dehydrator 
perfectly. And then what I do, the, the sort of common name for them is um, poor man's saffron. And uh, there is a little bit of that. Like, I mean, if you, it's not saffron. It is not, and it doesn't give that flavoring. But if you want to slightly color rice, you can add the, the dried petals into your rice as you're cooking it, and it does the job. Um, medicinally, they're another one. Again, scratching around the edges, not having any major knowledge, but I do know if you have eczema or anything like that, um, they are so good for your skin. Um, they're so good for uh, like cuts and abrasions if you make cream for it. Um, if Avril is here, I know Avril uses them in her soaps and they are absolutely beautiful from that point of view. Um, but also, um, I gotta tell you, I do tend to put everything into alcohol as well. So there will be a bit of alcohol going on. But if you add this into alcohol medicinally, and um, put the petals into vodka, say. Medicinally, that's incredibly good if you take a small, tiny amount for your stomach, if you have an upset stomach. But it, even apart from the medicinal side of it, if you just want to color your vodka or color your gin, it's beautiful. It goes a beautiful golden color and it's really, really lovely. Um, again, I use them for the, the, the alcohols that I tend to do. Um, yes, I do have a little tipple every now and then, but generally speaking, they're used in cooking. Uh, so I'm not. Well, maybe I'm touching on Keith Floyd, but not quite there yet. But um, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it is lovely. It's lovely. They're a great plant. And once you have them in the garden, you'll never be without them. And there's some beautiful varieties. Jimmy, my friend, again, who has this wonderful garden in Wicklow, he actually, um, he grows the most amazing calendula, the most beautiful varieties. Um, but there's loads of them. The, the, one of the nicest ones that I grew was Indian Prince, which is that deep orange color, but with that lovely brown center. That's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plant. Well worth having in your garden. Daily lilies. Oh my God. Daily lilies. What can I say about daily lilies? They are an amazing plant, an absolutely amazing plant. Now, don't be confused by the name. They are in the Hemerichalis. Um, group of plants. They're not lily plants as such. Um, they're slightly di different. Hence the trouble with common names. You always get that sort of confusion. But they are an incredible. Hemerichalis fulva is the one that I would most use. And they come in loads of different shapes and sizes. Um, everything from the petals and the roots, all the, the, the little roots are all edible. Uh, the leaves are edible, but a little note of warning, you don't want to eat too many of them. Seemingly, not that I know, but seemingly, um, they have a slightly hallucinogenic effect. So maybe be careful with that one. Um, but the flowers are gorgeous because they have that lovely, chunky kind of textural taste to them. Um, but as nice as they are raw, they are absolutely, absolutely delicious, transformed when you cook them. They are amazing. So the petals themselves, you can just cook up it like a, a, just a, a light kind of pan fry is delicious into a um, stir fry is delicious. But if anybody knows the plant, before the flowers come out, they put on these sort of long buds, you know, good sized buds. And what I tend to do with the buds then is just cut, the, take them early and pan fry them. They are fabulous. But you can also dehydrate them and save them. And they go into the likes of soups and um, soup predominantly. They are, they're beautiful in soups. And um, they're very traditional in Chinese and Korean soups. Um, uh, can't think of what the, the common, I think it's called golden needle soup. Um, but they are lovely and well worth a go. And again, from your own point of view, in your garden, they're one of the easiest plants to grow and they bulk up so quickly. And, you know, they're just glorious. They're absolutely glorious. And if you have space, get as many as you can, because <laughs> they are fantastic. And um, roses, I love roses. And this has been such a good year for roses. I hope everybody is having the same fabulous year for roses as I am. Um, I have a couple of plants to show you here that I'm bringing down to um, my other garden, Wendy's garden. Um, but one of them that I bought the other day was a Rosa Rugosa. Rosa Rugosa is the sort of, you know, it's the, our common or our wild uh, rose. 
and uh, it's the one that puts on the huge big hips and it's kind of the one that the, the council use all the time. But Rosa rugosa is a brilliant plant because it's not prone to black spot or diseases or stuff like that. It's very easy to grow. It's very, um, it's very rugged. It's very, you know, there's, there's no fussing with this plant, but the petals are delicious. All roses are edible. Some are nicer than others. Um, Rosa rugosa is delicious, absolutely delicious. And I eat those petals raw or uh, uncooked or else I um, dehydrate them, keep them for teas. Again, they're another great one for tea, especially a winter tea. Um, but also then I wait for the rose hips and I use the rose hips. And the rose hips could be, you know, I'd use them in syrups or I would use them in... Um, Jam is a pain in the butt, but jellies, jellies work really, really well with rose hips and they're fabulous. Um, syrups are great. Um, shrubs, if anybody has ever done shrubs, shrubs are fantastic. That's where you, you, um, you flavor vinegar and uh, you put your plant or your flower or whatever into um, say a bowl of vinegar, let it sit for a couple of days, then decant that and then you can keep it as that, as just a vinegar, a flavored vinegar, absolutely beautiful. But what you do for a shrub then is you add sugar into it. And then that shrub then becomes, you dilute it into something like fizzy water or champagne if you're being posh or um, anything like that. You know, it's a, just a lovely thing to do. And of course with shrubs, I use them all the time in things like um, dressings or you know, fish dishes, rice dishes. I have heaps of shrubs. I, I make a bloody shrub out of everything now at this stage. Um, again, if you're doing posh gin and tonic, a shrub in, into the gin and tonic is very, very nice. Um, but shrubs are brilliant and it's a great way to use up plants as well. Uh, next is begonias. Begonias, who knew? Begonias are just amazing. I brought one in just to show you. Um, I shouldn't be stepping away from the, the the screen, but this is just this is just your bog standard begonia. I mean, you can eat pretty much all begonias. Um, I have some very very you know exotic ones like sycamensis and things like that. I'm a bit precious about that, so I probably wouldn't eat that one so much. But you know, these are the lovely tuber ones. You can get them the honey basket ones. Any of that. Remember the caveat: let it go through a year or two before you start eating it. But they are delicious absolutely delicious it's like having a fizzy sherbet moment in your mouth you eat these and they there's just your mouth explodes with flavor the flavor it's really really good and it's one of those ones if you put it into your salad and you have friends around and they're eating your salad their salad and then all of a sudden you can see look some people's faces um it's funny to watch but they are absolutely delicious and you can not only eat the flowers and I generally take the petals off. I don't eat the whole flowers, but you can. Um, but I do generally just take the, pe the petals off pretty much because they're quite big. So it's better to let them go around. But also that beautiful stem as well. Um, it's like, again, like, a, you know, that Sarah Sally kind of thing, if, if you know what I mean about Sarah Sally, that sorrel kind of flavor. Um, it's it's just it's an amazing plant, an absolute amazing plant, and really really gorgeous, and well worth having it. Tuberous begonias, by all accounts, and just in case you're into making cheese or anything like that, the sap from tuberous begonias seemingly curdles milk. Now I haven't done it yet, but um, it's it's the way to do it without rennet. So I mean that's something to use. So that's our begonias, but they are wonderful. Asked our alliums, my lovely friend Stephen Barstow again. Um, uh, he is after getting himself a job over in Norway in one of the botanical gardens, and basically, what he's doing is he is cataloging and growing alliums in a huge quantity in every sort of so he's collecting them and he's growing them and then he's he's cataloging them and he's as happy as anything um, uh, he's just loving it uh, but basically all alliums again are edible some are better than others and of course if you look at those big sort of you know the globe master or you know the, the big ones that you'd use ornamentally they obviously have been bred for flowers so 
yeah, hit and miss. But the two here on the screen, one, the one on the right hand side is um, a Welsh onion. And then on the other side is the nodding onion. But there's loads of difference, like that beautiful yellow onion called Molly. Um, that's absolutely gorgeous. Um, all of them, they're fantastic. Chives, I mean, go, go as simple as chives. Go get chives and eat the flowers. I do egg sambos when we're going walking up the mountains for uh, me and the kids. And uh, onions don't go down too well, but chive flowers, win. Absolute win. So um, definitely alliums are a great one to have in the garden. I also have, if anybody knows it, um, it's Babington leek, which would be the Irish sort of wild leek or, or native leek. And oh, it is just the most amazing. It's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous plant. It's architectural. It grows in the garden. It's a huge, big, strong, sturdy plant. And it puts on a lovely kind of, um, you know, the way some onions form little um, bulbils. Up on, uh, up on top, it does the same. Um, so it's really easy to propagate. But in springtime, I just go out and I pull stems, you know, just pull little new growth coming out. Does the plant no harm whatsoever. And it is just, it's delicious. Absolutely delicious. It's like a big uh, scallion onion, if you know what I mean. Um, really, really tasty. So alliums are a great one, brilliant one to have in the garden. Mallows, any of the mallow family, you know, anything from hollyhocks to lavatera to um, marshmallow. Marshmallow is one of the best ones. Um, uh, marshmallow, I grow an awful lot of marshmallow and I grow it primarily for the, the flower and the young leaves. The young leaves are really good and they're very, very good if you want to um, add them to soups they pick in soups you know so they they've got that i can never say that word mucilinin genius you know that word you know that thickening basically so um they're very very good but of course marshmallows were tip or were traditionally used for making marshmallow and that you make from the root so you dig up your root and you boil it and you make the marshmallows then from from the the boiled liquid not that i have ever done it but I believe it is, it is, it is definitely what was done before. Then somebody told me the other day, actually, for the vegans out there, if you have used, I know vegans will always use um, uh, aquafaba, which is the water left over from the tin of chickpeas to beat up and make your meringues. But equally, if you have marshmallow in the garden, if you dig up the root, boil it, the water that's the residue water that you've, you've boiled it in will beat up to make meringues as well. So an incredibly useful plant. Very beautiful, um, very tasty, huge family, and, and just an incredible. I mean, I have tons of them, tons of them in the garden, all shapes and sizes, and they're just wonderful to have. The other thing with mallows that are very interesting is that once the flower goes over, the little seed makes a kind of, a, like it's like a small circular thing, like a, like a donut like a little donut and they're called mallow cheeses and they are incredibly good and um, delicious to eat. And I, what I would do is instead of using croutons in a salad, I collect those and add them into the, and you get that bite with a taste, with a flavor and it's delicious. It's really, really good. Um, so they're a lovely one to use and a beautiful plant, really, really beautiful plant. Bergamot or Menarda. Now, I'm terribly excited about this one because in my garden, my tiny little garden out there, I can't, I can't grow it because my garden is so full of plants that it crowds out uh, Menarda all the time and I lose them constantly and they don't like to be crowded, so they need a little bit of space. So I'm hoping down in my new garden now, I will actually be able to grow some nice ones. But Bergamo, um, uh, is, it's, it's an amazing plant, absolutely amazing plant. Um, in in um, uh, the Americas or in uh, North America, there was a tribe, there's a few tribes, but the particular one that I'm thinking of is the Oswego tribe of Indians. And they used to use bergamot, the leaves in a tea, um, which was incredibly popular. Of course, when the settlers came over, um, the settlers, got the tea or found the tea or drank the tea or whatever and of course thought this was delicious. Now it's not to be confused with uh, Earl Grey, that's a slightly different plant, but it is a beautiful tea. But for me it's the flower. The flower is nectar rich. 
and it is delicious. It's absolutely delicious. So each of those lovely little flowers coming out, I pull them out and then add them to salads and whatever. And they are so, so tasty. Um, but the leaves again like that, you can cut up and add it into a salad as well. It's a very strong leaf. So a little goes a long way. Um, so just try it out yourself and see what you think. But Menardas, Bergamo, Bee Balm, whatever, they are absolutely well worth having if you have a little bit of space and um, so beautiful in the garden and then of course lilac and lavender I put the two together because you know you have to be so even-handed with both of these because they are um oh, a little goes a long way I mean you can go from having something delicious to having something awful very very quickly so with lav uh, with lilac and uh, my god if my great grandmother she turned her grave now turn her grave if she heard me bringing lilac into the house must be very unlucky but anyway we'll move on from there um lilac what i do with lilac um a few different ways but lilac i tend to take the flowers and seep or steep them in something like um, cream or milk more so cream uh, and then you let them kind of sit for a couple of hours or even overnight if you can. And the flavor is sort of, you know, is imbibed into the, the cream. And then you whip up the cream or you have the cream over your um, strawberries. And that gives you that beautiful flavor of lilac without being overpowering, which is lovely. But equally, they're very good with, um, with dairy. So if you have them with, you know, cheeses or yogurts or anything like that, they're incredibly good. Lavender, on the other hand, you do have to be very, very careful because it goes from being really, really lovely to that awful, soapy, horrible, you know, desperate kind of taste um, very, very quickly. You know, it's almost like one piece too many kind of tips you over. Um, but they are wonderful. And what I do with lavender, just kind of just to be sure, is I take a big jar of castor sugar. And I add the lavender to the castor sugar. And again, you let it just sit. And then when I'm making my shortbread or, you know, if I'm making whatever, you know, I add the lavender, I let the castor sugar to it mm -hmm. and discard the lavender. And that is, that is a nice way of doing it. And it's a bit safer, to be honest. But they are wonderful and they are lovely and they dry well. And um, they're pungent, the pungent flowers. And um, the next two then are mimosa and sakura. And mimosa, of course, is acacia del bata, or any of the acacias, but particularly del bata. And these are a really, really nectar-rich flower. And um, Wendy, my pal, who has the land, Wendy had, um, oh, Wendy's a brilliant grower, an absolute brilliant grower. Marianne would have been down in her garden. She's one of the, you know, Ireland's, not for, well, one of the first organic growers in Ireland and uh, or, or, or uh, promoters of it as such. But she is, uh, she used to grow flowers for this uh, amazing chef locally. And this wonderful woman, I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but this wonderful woman would do a seven course um, a meal, seven courses in the meal. And in each course, it revolved around flowers in some way or another. One of her favorite things was to take the mimosa and you, you, you cut it early in the morning so it's full of nectar, or full of pollen. And then what she would do is she would make up a very, very light tempura batter. And she would dip the, the mimosa into it. And then she would deep fry it or pan fry it or whatever what she would do with it. But it would come out and it would be delicious, absolutely delicious. So it's, it's definitely, it kind of, we had a terrible bad winter a couple of years ago. Maybe, oh God, I can't even remember now, four or five years ago. and. The, the bad winter hobbled an awful lot of those beautiful acacia trees. And it's only this year I start seeing them coming back again. So it's very exciting to see the acacia come back. They're such a beautiful, it's a real sign of spring as well when you see the acacia. And then of course, cherry blossom. I mean, perfect spring plant. The blossoms themselves taste lovely. They taste of, of almonds. They're absolutely beautiful. But Sakura, of course, is, um, that's the Japanese name for them. And they're very, very important in Japanese culture and in Japanese food. And they revolve around everything, tea ceremonies, uh, weddings, everything. I mean, they're very, very important. 
Um, but one of the things, how you make the Sakura, I tried making it the, uh, about two years ago and it's, 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 it's a fabulous process, but basically you collect your, your, your cherry blossom and you steep it in a vinegar. Uh, oh God, I should have looked up the recipe now. I think it's a vinegar and salt. Must look it up again. If, if anybody's interested, do look up the recipe for Sakura. But basically, once you once you steep the flour in it, then you take out the flour, let it dry, and then you you put it into the dehydrator and dry it. And then what happens then? How you would use it? How they use it in Japan is they take that flour, which is very pungent, very strong, and they steep it in water, and they wait till the flavor is right you know, like if they taste it until it's the right flavor they want. And then they use the liquid, not the flour, the liquid to flavor either the rice or they make a beautiful dessert, like a rice, a little small rice bowl dessert thing. Um, and that's, that's how they control because the flavor is very strong. It is fermented in some form or another. And so it does kind of have that pungency to it. Um, but it's very interesting. It's very, very, I don't know. It's, necessarily for everybody maybe our tastes just have to evolve to that kind of flavoring but it um it is beautiful and then of course you know now we move on from from the flowers or we graduate from the flowers into to sort of tubers uh, and of course dahlias not only do we get the flowers but we also get a tuber and of course dahlias originally would have been brought into europe as a food crop um, because they have huge tubers, huge big tubers. If anybody grows dahlias, you know how big the tubers can get. Um, but they were originally a flower, or they were originally a food crop. But of course, our lovely Victorians, when the Victorians got their hands in them, they, their genetic makeup allows them to cross really, really well. And to, you, you can do incredible breeding programs with dahlias. And of course, the Victorians copped this. And they went hell for leather for the blooms and forgot about the tubers. The tubers got left behind. So, of course, as the years have gone on, the tubers have become less and less important from that point of view. And it's all about the flowers. And, of course, when you breed for one uh, you know, part of a plant rather than the other, you do, there's, there's a, a quid pro quo, you do lose parts of it. So what I would suggest when you're doing dahlias is... Um, if, if you try the first one and you don't like the taste of it, don't be put off altogether. You know, do try a few till you figure out, you know, till you find the nice one. Um, Jimmy, my lovely pal, again, he did a Dahlia trial there about oh, a couple of years ago and I got to try loads of them. And um, I tell you, it's definitely, it's definitely seedlings. It's the ones that you've grown yourself. Um, if you collect the seeds and then regrow them, you get really good tubers from that. Um, it's also species varieties um, and it's also, um, you know, oh, the, the, the sort of common rule of thumb as such with dahlias is it's orange variety or orange colored ones. But those cactus, you know, the ones that are more not this floribunda kind of, you know, tightly flowered um, plant. It's more the ones that have the, the fingers, the, the, the cactus flowered uh, dahlias that uh, produce the best flowers uh, or best tubers. But the flowers are edible. And then as an added benefit, you get these amazing tubers. And the tubers really are delicious. I mean, you can grate them. You can make rosties or um, uh, the Happy Pear Boys. Uh, for anybody who don't know the Happy Pears, I'm terribly sorry, but they're a local restaurant down here. And the two boys are like, they're very enthusiastic about food. And uh, they make up a beetroot burger. But instead of using the beetroot, I used the dahlias. And oh my God, it was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Even the kids ate it, which was amazing. Um, but uh, the, yeah, so you can, you know, make Rosti's burgers, anything like that. Boiled are delicious. Steamed is delicious. Stir fried is delicious. And uh, you can't mash them. It's not like a potato, you can't mash them. But they're incredibly nutritious and well worth a try. Well worth a try. And then if you, do, if you just want to eat the petals, go for the petals. They're so dramatic. So dramatic in the salad. Um, and then, of course, Akas. Akas. Oh my God, I love Akas. Um, these are from the Andes or that area. And they, along with a couple of other ones, they're like Uluko and Yakan and a few other different types. Um, they are, they're sort of the new cool things to grow. Well, 
okay, cool for me. <laughs> but they are amazing. Um, they are beautifully coloured. They're about, okay, so they can come in pinks, green, uh, pinks, yellows, um, um, oranges, uh, reds, beautiful colours. Generally speaking, they're about the size of your finger and maybe thicker. Uh, you can eat them raw or cooked. Uh, raw, they have a, a faint, a sort of a, a, a lemony flavor. And cooked, again, like that, they actually hold the texture very, very well. But I was on a trial a couple of years ago. I was on a, a, an ACA trial, uh, or an ACA breeding program. Sorry, not a trial, a breeding program. And basically, the idea behind it was, ACAs are what they call a short day tuber, which means they don't tend to make their tubers, they don't make their tubers until the daylight starts decreasing. And of course that means that your your tubers are very late in the season, which is not really a bad thing. But there's a couple like Riz Owen, who you saw earlier on. Owen, Owen is an incredible guy over in England and he um he basically started this trial and what he wanted to do was to breed a day neutral variety so that it, you'd have a much longer season but as well as that we bred like we 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 selected for size and flavor as well so i have one and that the yucca trial is still ongoing it's it's just it's it's amazing what they're doing um but i have one particular one that i grow uh down in wendy's and it is a decent sized tuber it's about that size it is beautiful in flavor really really good it's absolutely beautiful and they're incredibly good for you they're in uh, like full of nutrient um also you can eat those leaves as well now they are part of the oxalic uh, oxalis family so you know along with all of those um sarsalis sorrels all the rest of it you do have to be just slightly mindful that you don't want to eat too much of it um when I say too much, like, I mean, you'd really want to be, you know, eating bowlfuls day after day after day to really have an effect. But, you know, just be mindful. But a couple of bits and pieces into your salad is not going to do any, any harm whatsoever. And they are so tasty. And they have that sorrel flavor, you know, that, that kind of lovely sour flavor. Uh, and the flowers, of course, are edible as well. But the tubers, the tubers are amazing. Next one, Tigridia. Now, Tigridia is an old-fashioned plant and a really pretty plant. And I don't know why we don't grow more of it. Um, it's just, it's so lovely. That's Tigridia pavona. And it is, um, they're, they're another ephemeral plant. They literally, you know, the, the flower comes up in the morning and it's gone by the evening. Um, you know, but they're plentiful and they're so easy to grow and they're so easy to grow from seed. Um, they really are incredibly good, but it's the tuber. <gasps> no, it's not a tuber, it's a corm. And the corm is absolutely, possibly one of the most exquisite things I've ever tasted. It's almost like, so, so what I did with it, they're small, they're only about that size. But what I did with it is I baked it in the oven and the, the outer skin or the outer layer crisps up. So you get this kind of almost like flaky pastry. It's not pastry, obviously, but that, that kind of flakiness like a puff pastry or whatever. Um, yeah, whatever. Um, and then the inside is that beautiful kind of um, flowery potato. It's not potato, but it's sweeter. It's like a sweet chestnut. It is. Delicious, absolutely delicious. And a couple of years ago, I, it's, it's, it's too big to bring inside now at the moment, but a couple of years ago, I went to Crick Nurseries over in Wales, if anybody knows them. Um, they're an amazing couple who go, again, go off plant hunting, you know, all over the world and come back with fantastic stuff. But I got one particular Tigridia from them, which is basically um, a bigger, a bigger, oh, is that me doing that? Not sure. Anyway, um, Tigridia. Tigridia is the is a plant. It's it's a flower. Is that somebody saying what is this? Not sure. Um, but um, Tigridia. Sorry. Is a yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes, it's me. It's because I didn't know how. I I cannot understand the name of that plant. Okay, Tigridia. T i g r i d i a. Tigridia. And I think Thank its you. common name is something like tiger flower. So it's T A. Sorry, can you repeat the claim, please? 
T I G R I D I A. And if you want, we'll put this up in the in the questions later. I'll give you actually, do you know what? I actually have um notes that I can send on to Marianne and Marianne will have all the word, uh, all the names in it. That will be lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not at, all, not at all a pleasure. It is a gorgeous one though. It's really well worth happening in your garden and it's beautiful. But the 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 plant from Krug Nurseries is hopefully going to be a bigger plant with a bigger tuber it's too young yet i'm not even chancing my arm taking it out of the pot but i'm going to let it bulk up and hopefully they'll have bigger tubers um but we'll wait and see we'll wait and see it's well worth a try though next we'll go on then to greens edible greens so edible greens i mean the very first one of course is hostas and of course, every gardener kind of groans at me when I suggest you might eat your hostas. But do you know something? Because I mean, like as a gardener growing hostas, you're trying to keep the slugs away from them, not, you know, never mind you eating them. But, you know, come spring, it is, it's just, you, you're just pruning. You're only pruning. You're only just taking off a couple of little growths, like the hostens. That's what they're called, hostens. Hostens are the young furling growth that comes up. If anybody grows uh, hostas, uh, you'll know that young furling kind of uh, emerging growth that comes with your hosta. Um, it is beautiful. This is, again, a Japanese veg. You know, they, they grow this um, commercially. Uh, they also it grows wild on the hills, and it is they're 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 called mountain veg. And um, there's a whole heap of different ones like Aurelia cordata and a few other different ones. But this particular one um, literally grows up the hills, and it is it's kind of like it's one of those signs of a bit like the the cherry blossom. It's one of those signs of spring when you see the Japanese you know people from the cities going out and and climbing the mountains to get their hostas, get their hostens, their little small growth and it's just lovely it really is steamed pan fried um oh my god it's a wonderful veg i don't know why we don't eat it. well i do know why because they're so bloody you know the slugs eat most of them and you're so precious with your hostas but if you have the space and you can afford them or you can keep them in a pot if you can keep them in the pot it's brilliant um and you can happily cut two or three you know, um, uh, you know, you can happily cut, you can graze the, the, the plants as they're coming up and you can do maybe a cut or two from each pat and you know, it, it's perfect, it's absolutely lovely. So do try hostas, I promise you. Hosta flowers, you know the beautiful flowers that are about coming out now, if anybody has hostas, try them. They're fabulous. They're absolutely fabulous. Again, a bit like daylily, they have that sort of meat, like that, that texture, that really good texture, but they're full of nectar and very sweet. Beautiful, beautiful plants. Next one, of course, is Solomon seal. Solomon seal is, um, it, again, it's probably in an awful lot of our gardeners, our gardens. It's in old gardens, you know, it's another good old, it's a, it's a doer of a plant, you know, it's a really good doer good for great shade plants you know those horrible areas that you have in the garden um solomon seal is wonderful the polygonatum family um it's the young growth that's coming up that's what you're going to eat now foragers always suggest or you know if, if anybody is talking about fo wild foods or whatever you kind of say well what does it taste like and everything tastes like asparagus you know <laughs> like it's it's like a bean joke yeah it tastes like asparagus but this actually does taste a little bit like asparagus it's kind of a gentler now it's not as thick as asparagus either so it's much more it's about pencil pin um but it's well worth it. It's lovely. And again, you're not harming the plant. If you take a couple of cuts from the plant as it's growing up, it's only promoting the plant to grow even harder. So it's well worth it. It's absolutely well worth it. Um, uh, herbally as well, or you know, medicinally, it's supposed to be, I think it's the root, could be wrong on this now, don't quote me, but some part of the plant is incredibly good at healing bruises as well. So if there's any herbalist out there, Avril will probably tell you, but if um, it's one of those ones that is incredibly good for bruises. Um, uh, yeah, it's well worth it. Well worth it. Great plant. Beech leaves. So beech leaves. Now we're talking about beech, the tree. Um, 
is it, it's, you know, in spring when they're putting on those really soft, young, beautiful, almost see-through lime colored leaves, those beautiful cathedral effect in springtime. It's those leaves that you want. And they are wonderful in um, a salad. Like you're talking early now. So it's, it's wonderful to bulk up your salad with, with beech leaves. They really are quite delicious. Um, but also, now we're back to alcohol again. I'm terrible, sorry if I'm offending anybody with all the alcohol references. But again, this is for cooking. In the children's, there is a, um, a drink a kind of a local drink called Noi. That's N-O-Y-E-A-U, I think, Noi. And I first came across it in a book by Richard Maybe. Um, called Food for Free. If you can see that, Food for Free. Yeah, maybe. And he describes how in the children's they make this drink and basically what they do is they take the young beech leaves put them into a big jar a kilner jar something with a lid on it and they squish the, the, the leaves right down um I, you tend to put a weight on it or even a sterilized stone a beech stone or whatever just something to hold the leaves down and then you fill the jar with gin and you let it sit and you let it sit for probably about six to eight weeks and then after that, once it's got to the right sort of color, you can tell the color, it goes a beautiful, like a, like a chartreuse a green color. It's beautiful color. And uh, once, once you get to the right, like about eight weeks, you decant, you take the leaves out, get rid of those, and then taste it at that stage. If you like that sort of lovely, sharp schnapps flavor, then it's perfect. But the drink traditionally involved adding sugar to it. So you would add sugar into it and you would dissolve it and you'd let it sit for another couple of weeks and then you would use it. And then it becomes like a sake, like, like a sake almost, not quite, but in and around that sort of flavor. And it is, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And again, I use it. It is lovely to drink, but I do use it in... Um, in dressings, it's amazing in dressings. It's incredible with fish dishes. And it's really, really good if you're doing some sort of fragrant rice dish, like a Persian dish or something. Really, really good from that point of view. So it's well worth a try. Now we've, wait till next, the next lot of green leaves, but um, it is well worth a, a go. It's fabulous. And uh, then of course we have beach mast. And it, beach mast is just the nuts that fall off. And um, they are wonderfully nutritious, but they're fiddly. You have to take off that outer shell and then you're left with an inner shell and you're trying to pick off the inner shell. And then you're left with a tiny, tiny little nut um, about the size of a pine nut. Um, but they're incredibly good for you and they're really lovely. And if you're going out for a walk with the kids in the woods or whatever, it's just a nice thing to do, a nice fiddly little thing to, you know, slow food. We need more slow food. It's a lovely slow food. Uh, so that's, that's, that's beach for you and love beach. And again, in an urban situation, it's nearly even better because so many urban situations or urban houses or urban um, areas have beach hedges. And of course, beach hedges are wonderful because everything is at, you know, hand level or eye level. So it's easy to, to gather up your leaves in, in springtime. Um, it's a great, great, great thing to have. Next, we have tilia or lime leaves. Um, tilia cordata or tilia ex europea is the two that you would typically use. These are, if anybody knows anything about forest gardening, these are the ones that are kind of, that forest gardeners love. Um, they are again spring veg, um, really good, really tasty. And in a forest garden situation, what you typically do is you pollard the tree. So you cut the tree every couple of years at about six or, yeah, about six, about five or six feet. And that does a couple of things. One, it encourages these beautiful leaves to grow, you know, but more importantly, it encourages, like it, it's, at, at, it's at collecting height, you know, it's closer to you. Um, it really is gorgeous. It's lovely. And of course, in forest gardening, then what you do is you grow your kiwi up the, the line or the tilia. And, oh God, I love forest gardening because it's so clever. You know, 
you have a kiwi that's growing up. I can sh like my kiwi out there now is gone bananas, and I need to get out and cut it. But with this system, because it's growing up a tree that you pollard every two years, while you're pollarding it, you're also cutting your kiwi. Brilliant. Two jobs done in one. Love it. Um, so it's a great way to do it. But uh, Tilia is wonderful. Now, if you wanted to bring it a little bit further and go for your linden, linden flowers for your tea, again, herbally, they're supposed to be great for something, and I can't remember what it is, but um, herbally, you could look that up. Um, linden tea is linden flowers are fabulous. And but you can't color it, obviously. You have to let the tree grow to its, 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 its proper size for the flowers to happen. Um, uh, but well worth it, well worth it. It's a great, great leaf for bulking up salads, as I said. Um, and it's just, it's a wonderful spring green. These are all spring greens. You know, that, that time where it's, it's not quite the hungry gap, but it's literally coming from, you know, like, I mean, when there's nothing else around, uh, these are, they're, they're just so good. And of course, now we have rollicking ramsons. This, this is not, I wouldn't suggest anybody put this into their garden because they just got bananas. But if you were lucky enough to have a huge garden or a nice, you know, a, a, a big garden that has a wild area that these guys might be coming into anyway, um, oh, it's wonderful. Wild garlic. It's wild garlic, basically, if anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, when we go out into the countryside in springtime, you're just hit by this waft of garlic as you kind of walk along the country lanes. And uh, that's with the big, beautiful leaves. And you make pesto with the leaves. And they're so good and so nice. Even soups. Um, tonics even they're so good from that point of view then the little buds down there if you see down in the right hand corner those buds are are beautiful in that um they're very nutritious and they're they again do the job of of like capers like i had um i had a salad oh i had a kind of a, a chickpea dish the other day and i added these guys into it and they were so good but what i do with them is i either put them into vinegar or I ferment them in spring, and then you can store them. But a pal of mine called down the other day, Courtney, and Marianne might have met Courtney as well. Uh, she's, she, she lives down in Wicklow, but Courtney is, she's a foodie, like me, she's a foodie, but she's, I mean, she's fabulous at fermenting and all of those, like she's like a witch in the woods, you know, she's just, she's amazing, absolutely amazing. She brought me down a jar of these, and what she had done was she had uh, preserved them in um, honey. <gasps> it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Because you've got that lovely sweetness, but you've got the garlicness as well. And they are just delicious. And again, if you wanted to add, you know, I like what did I put them into? I think, did I put them into, I think I put them into a soup because I had no garlic. And I didn't want the, it to be, it was a beetroot soup and I didn't want it to be overpowering. So I added these guys in and the honey gave the sweetness and the garlic kind of just came as a, a, as a soft undertone to it. And it was just lovely. It was perfect actually. So I'm definitely using honey next time. And if you can get your own local honey, oh, even better. I mean, you know, we should all be doing, as everybody knows, we should be looking after the local suppliers and buying our local produce and all of that sort of stuff. So if you have a honey, um, a, a, a guy who makes honey or who, who sells honey, go for that. But of course, the flowers are delicious as well. They're, it's so well worth. And there's two different types. There's the ramson, which is the wider leaf one. And then you have the three corner leaf, which is the one that has, if you feel the stem, there's like three points to it. Both are edible. But the ramson is better because the wider leaf makes the pesto much easier. You know, it's an, it's an easier job. Um, and what I do with the pesto is I make up huge batches and then put them into smaller little bits and put them into the freezer. And then when you're making your pasta pesto or whatever, you just take out your pesto. Fabulous. Well worth it. Next one then we have is bamboo. And I was telling you about bamboo earlier on. Bamboo, if you have space for bamboo, you couldn't grow a better plant. I mean, it's wonderful, architecturally beautiful. Um, sound is amazing. Um, you know, everything about bamboo is just wonderful. But of course, it's also edible. And any of that phyllostachys family, 
particularly Philostachus um, edulis. Anything with edulis, by the way, it's, it's, you know, it's one to watch for. But um, it is, it is, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. Now, the thing you have to want, uh, be careful with, with bamboo is, you know, you turn your back and a second later, it's grown way too big, you know, so they grow so, so fast. So what you want to do is you want to cut it at about um, the cocoons and you want to cut them at about maybe six to eight inches, that sort of size. Have I got a picture of it? There we are. So that's the sort of size you want to cut it at that stage. And you've got to be, you know, you really got to watch out because literally overnight they can, you know, grow another foot, you know, and they're too woody then at that stage. You kind of miss the boat. So watch out for the, the, the new growth coming up. Now, the thing with bamboo is some, how you do it is you peel off those sort of papery sheets and then what you're left with inside is a kind of a pit and it's the pit that you eat. And some of those, that, that pit, is perfectly delicious, fresh, you know, not cooked. And then some is very um, bitter. So if it's, if you're right, not like the, nothing's going to poison you here. So don't worry about that. But if, if uh, you've tasted your own one and it's too bitter, all you have to do is just steep it in water for a couple of hours or steam it, even steam it for a couple of minutes. And it takes that bitterness out of it. And then you use it in your Chinese dishes. You use it in your salads. You use it in, it's just a veg, uh, stir fries. Um, you know, it's so versatile. It's a great, great plant to have. But of course, it lends itself to fermenting and to, um, to vinegars and all of that sort of preserving as well. So it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. And it really is well worth growing if you have the space. And do remember, typically you have two types. You have the runners that run all over the place and take over and the clumpers. And then with the clumpers, you know, you just, it, it, if you have a, a small enough space, just keep an eye on them. Don't, you know, because they do. I have a clumper and I have to tell you, that clumper is now pulling up. Well, it's not, let's not go overboard, but it is moving. It is moving. So, you know. I'm not quite sure if there's a safe bamboo, if there's a bamboo that will just stay still for you, because I don't think there is. Let's say keep it in a pot. Anyway, they're a wonderful, 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 wonderful plant and definitely worth it in a garden. Next one then is Shingiku, or what's the other word for it? Chapsui greens, um, or the proper name for it is Chrysanthemum carinaria. And uh, this is the chrysanthemum family. Most chrysanthemums are completely edible as well. And uh, they're really good. But this particular one is very popular in Korean and Japanese and Chinese and Asian cooking because you, you grow it as a crop more so than anything else. And you keep it, you don't let it flower. So you keep it at about maybe 12, about six, about eight inches. And then you just harvest the greens as and when you need them. Um, but of course, look at those flowers. I mean, you could not let it flower. So of course they always flower in my garden, but the petals are delicious and you can still eat the greens. It's not like you can't eat them, but they're well worth it really really good green really good green um and of course now i hope uh, i'm not running out of time i haven't even looked at a watch but uh we'll keep we we'll fly through these so edible berries this is the last kind of section and edible berries again we're only touching on them because there's loads loads and loads and loads and loads but my first absolute favorite is mahonia or oregon grape Mahonia is that it's in the Berberus family. So there are those wonderful architectural plants that are quite spiky, but they are just beautiful. They make these, you know, like strings of berries, huge berries. Um, they're all different in flavor. Some are sharp and some are very sharp. Um, and typically what you would do is you would make jams and jellies with them. Um, what I do is I make the Mahonia shrub or Mahonia, Mahonia shrub is my all time favorite shrub. Um, so I either do a Mahonia vinegar or a Mahonia shrub, whichever takes my fancy at the time. Um, and basically what you do is you take your berries and you take them off the plant. You have to, it's, it's a fight between you and the starlings. 
it's uh you know and i do leave some for the starlings it's not like i just steal them all i do leave some for the starlings but it's it's like marauding teenage gangs come in of starlings and strip the whole plant so you got to get in first um, so you get your, your, your crop of berries and then what I do is I put them into a bowl and I mash them up with a potato masher and then I pour my vinegar and I, we, Dan, myself and Wendy, we, t we make our own cider vinegar. So we've heaps of it. So I use cider vinegar, but you can use any vinegar. I've used, um, I've used uh, balsamic. I've used white wine vinegar. I've used loads of different vinegars, each giving a slightly different flavoring um but apple cider for me is just wonderful and i have heaps of it so that's what i use so apple cider goes into it and you just put a tea towel over it and you let it sit for about uh let's see now you'd let it sit for maybe two or three days just keep coming back to it and once you start, you see it starting to bubble you know it's fermenting it's doing the right thing so um after about two or three days then i take the i strain the berries out of it and I, I'd, I'd actually put it through muslin just to make sure that you have everything out of it or a jelly bag, uh, whichever you have. And then I would bottle it up if I'm just doing the vinegar. But if I'm making the shrub, then I add in the sugar like I was telling you before, and then I bottle it up. Oh my God, it is divine. Absolutely divine. Oh God, I know I say everything's divine. I know I'm desperate for it, but I'm telling you now, <laughs> you to do anything. It's mahoney berries. They are so, so, so good. And of course, this is a wonderful plant because, of course, the flowers are edible as well. But if you eat the flowers, you don't tend to get the berries. So it's kind of, you know, you, it's a trade off. But the other side to this plant too is it's amazing dye plant. So if anybody's into dyeing their own uh, wools or fabrics or anything like this, this is an, all of this Berberus family have a thing called berberine in the in the the wood. So again, like the 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 roots at the bar, the the bar, the, the the woody part, all have this beautiful. If you peel back the bark, it's yellow inside, and they all have this amazing ability to color a sort of a lovely orangey ranging from or yellow orange to brown those kind of color ranges um uh, and they're just like i mean they're incredible they're absolutely incredible so this this really is one of my favorite plants uh the next one then is barbary the berberus it's in the same family so this this is your berberus darwinii or your berberus there's heaps of berberus and they all have the same thing this is an even better not an even better berry it's not even better because i love my mahonia but it's a really good berry because what you do with this one is you do dry this one this one is really good for drying and then what you do is you add it then into things like if you're making um muffins or scones or christmas cake or whatever you add the berries into it then at that stage or you add it into Persian cooking. So you would add it into your rice dishes, your pilafs, your couscous, all of those lovely, lovely kind of big Persian dishes. And um, really, really good. And it's a lovely plant and the bees love it. And again, it has that dyeability as well. It's super, absolutely super plant. Next. How many times have I said this is my favorite plant? This is my favorite, absolute favorite. This beautiful plant is so so useful because this is Eliagnus umbilatus the top one and angustifolia is the bottom one they are a wonderful plant because if you live by the coast these are sea tolerant they are very sea tolerant so literally if you have salt winds whipping through your garden these are an amazing wind barrier so these are your first line of defense um, they're incredibly easy to grow. They're incredibly easy to grow from cuttings. Uh, they make huge, big, strong plants, particularly on Balata. It can get up to maybe, I don't know, two meters tall. And, you know, it's a fine, substantial plant. Uh, they're very attractive. They've got a beautiful leaf and then a silver back or gold back to them. But then it's the berry. Do you see that beautiful red berry? Oh, my God. When I was over with Martin Crawford, I did his course over, oh God, it was five years ago now, I'd say at this stage. He had a huge plant and uh, his wife had done, she had made the lunch for us. And of course, everything in the lunch came from the garden, but she had made, um, she made two things. She made jam out of this guy, but she also made a kind of a, um, uh, like a mixed dish, like there was, there was grains and berries and nuts and everything in it. It was fabulous. These were the berries. They were divine 
divine, 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 divine. Couldn't say it often enough. They're absolutely brilliant. And then, so that, the, its common name is called the autumn olive. And then the one down below it, Angustifolia. Now there's heaps of different uh, Eliagnus. There's loads of them. Um, there's another one called Gumi. Uh, common name is Gumi. It's multiflora, I think. There's Exabingii, Eliagnus Exabingii. That's the one that um, you would see kind of along coastal areas that the, the council use it all the time. And it's a great plant. It's a great utility plant. It's fabulous, quick to grow. It's, it's super. It does actually put on a berry. And the other thing is there is a seed or a stone inside these berries, but they are also edible. They're, you can chomp away on those. There's no problem. But the, um, the Angustifolia there, I just added that one in because if you wanted to kind of extend your season, this one is an early season um, berry. So it kind of berries up about, I think it's May, June, that sort of time where the other ones, well, Exabingii comes kind of June, July, and then uh, Umbalata obviously is later in the year as well. But it is, um, oh, it's a great berry. It's a great berry. It's a great useful tree. It's also, if anybody knows what I mean by a nitrogen fixer, um, if you're into forest gardening, um, the idea with the forest gardening is that you want the system to take care of itself. So you want the system to put nutrient back into the soil. And of course, nitrogen fixing plants will do that for you. So that it, it, it literally, it takes it from the, the atmosphere and through um, loads of kind of fabulous fungi or bacteria, it, it, uh, it adds the nitrogen back into the, the, the soil and makes it available for other plants to use. Um, so from that point of view, it's an incredibly useful plant in a system um, in your own garden if you just want to block out the winds and whatever or you want to have a beautiful plant with lovely berries oh my god couldn't couldn't recommend it highly enough it's super absolutely super fuchsias fuchsias all fuchsias a uh, lovely lady from Kerry. I mean, you couldn't get better fuchsias in Kerry. I mean, they're just fabulous. They're not a native plant in Ireland, but they are, what do they call those? Um, not hybridized. Oh, what do you call it? What do you call it? When a native plant, or when a plant becomes so common that it's almost native. Naturalized, naturalized. They're a naturalized plant. Um, so there's tons of different, and Avril gave me some fabulous fuchsias. Fuchsia splendens and... God, I can't remember what other ones, Avril. Um, there was lovely ones anyway. This one here is Arborescence, which is, uh, I mean, you wouldn't even see, you would, the, the picture on the right-hand side is what I'm talking about. You, I mean, it doesn't even look like a fuchsia, does it? It has these round berries. Uh, they're delicious. They're absolutely delicious. All fuchsia berries are edible. All fuchsia flowers are edible. But some berries have a peppery kick to them. So some of them can, you know, you'd eat it and everything is going well. It tastes like a grape. And then all of a sudden you get this, <coughs> not quite choking, but you get a kick at the back of your throat, uh, which is the kind of peppery element coming into it. So some are more peppery than others. Some have none of that peppery stuff at all. Uh, but they are, um, oh God, they're great. And they're another one. If you want to make that sort of hedgerow jam or hedgerow, you know, that lovely mixed berry, you know, whatever is out, just stick it in. Um, it's a great one to have in it. And it's just a great one just to eat as you're puddling along the, the, the road or whatever. It's a super, 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 super plant. And it's so beautiful. And when you get really lovely ones, like the species ones, like the, um, the fuchsia splendens or arborescence or, um, oh my God, there's another one and I can't think for what it is. Um, they really do produce really good berries, really good size berries as well. I, I can never figure out why these aren't a commercial, you know, they're so good. Um, but it, it's just a wonderful thing to have, absolutely wonderful. And then we go on to Leicesteria formosa. Leicesteria formosa is one of those plants that is literally like a weed. It'll grow anywhere. It's absolutely, you know, um, it's, it's just, it's incredible, incredible plant. When I was learning, I, I did a horticultural uh, course years ago, the RHS one. And I remember our, our teacher at the time was basically saying, you know, like, I mean, it's like, look at the chimney pot. You know, Leicesteria formosa grows in chimney pots, basically. It'll grow anywhere. But it, it used to be, and now it can be invasive, so it's one to be careful with. I know kind of up around 
County Down, I think, there was terrible problems because it was originally put in as this pheasant berry, you know, this pheasant bush where the you would put it in, the pheasants would hide in it, then the guys would come along with their clappers, the pheasants would go up and the poor old fellows would meet their demise. But um, it does spread, it does spread. In a garden situation, it's perfectly, you know, controllable it's there's no problem to it and um, and it's those berries do you see those berries on it they they literally ripen from the top down and you eat them when they are so ripe that they're squidgy that you you, you touch them and they almost squidge in your fingers and um, they taste of burnt candy not burnt candy what you call that sugar candy sugar candy or that kind of um that lovely kind of caramelly flavor they are fabulous. And again, I reckon the reason they're never commercially available is because you can't crop them. They literally, they, like, I mean, these things just literally come apart in your fingers as you're eating them. They're just delicious. But they are wonderful to have in your garden. And I know there's cultivars out there as well that might not be as aggressive as Formosa. So that's well worth having a look at, it. you know, if, if you were worried about uh, it's spreading, but I really wouldn't, you know, where they spread is literally if they're introduced into the wild and they're let just off they go. Um, it's, you know, as I said, in a garden situation, they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And they have this beautiful kind of arching habit and they're kind of see-through. Um, uh, they're just lovely. I, I can't say enough about them. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Oh my God. Okay. This is my favorite berry, favorite. I know, I seriously, I, seriously, seriously. This is my say, can I say, this is my um, uh, favorite late season berry. Let's put it that way. Okay, so this is Myrtus Ugni or Ugni Mullinay. Uh, that's how you pronounce it, Chilling Guava. And this reportedly is or was Queen Victoria's favorite berry. And Queen Victoria seemingly used to get it grown, or have, uh, uh, had it grown down in Devon and Cornwall. And then it was shipped up to London or whatever. And she would have her big kitchens make jam with it. And she loved it. This berry, if anybody hasn't tasted this berry, please do try and get it. It is wonderful. It's a gorgeous plant. It's just a cute little not cute, you can't say a myrtle is cute, but it's a it's an easy to grow small myrtle. Small little thing. Um no it can get it can get big if you let it, but it is very controllable and it has those lovely glossy leaves on it. It has a good habit and uh, it's easy to grow. It's fairly pest, you know, free. There's no problem. And it has these beautiful fragrant flowers, really, really, really fra fra fragrant flowers. And then it has this wonderful berry. And the berry comes out anytime from say November to well probably October to December that sort of because I've often put it into fruit salads for Christmas and all the rest of it and it is just it tastes of like an exotic strawberry almost it is so lovely a really 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 good berry to have and of course there's you know, there's, they are actually incredibly easy to grow as well. You can grow from cuttings, you can grow from seed. Um, they really are incredible. But, um, oh my God, what is that fabulous guy's name? Oh God, guys, I can't think of his name. Uh, he's the botanist over in England, young fella. Uh, and he does all the foods. Oh, I can't think of his name. Anyway, he has an incredibly, uh, um, variety that he grows and I got it for a pal of mine uh two years ago and I was down to taste the berries last year they're huge they're, they're big and they're juicy and they're gorgeous uh I'll think of his name I'll think of his name but um if 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 at all possible try and get those ones they're well worth no matter what what uh plant you get and you will get them now in gardens uh garden um uh clubs or not garden clubs um Oh, my brain has gone dead. Uh, garden centres. You will get them in garden centres. So it's if you see it, definitely put that one on your list of must-haves. Chanel Malays, which of course is the ornamental quince. Now we're nearly there. Hang in there with me, people. Um, this is a gorgeous springtime plant. I have it out in my garden out there. It's so pretty. It makes a lovely kind of, you know, 
you can train it up a wall, the whole lot of it. Uh, it's really lovely, but then it puts on these beautiful, they're not a true quince, they're an ornamental quince, but you can almost use them exactly the same as you would the quince cydonica. Um, they are, they're just lovely. They're very, very fragrant. Now, okay, they're not something you eat raw because if you cut them open, they're almost hard inside. So basically what I do is I cut them up and then I'd add them into like, if I was doing apple, I would add them into apple. Or if, God, even casseroles, they're amazing in casseroles. If, if say you were doing some sort of like a pork casserole or something like that, they're amazing. Or vegetable, you know, fabulous from that point of view. But one of the most delicious ways to do, or delicious uh, things to do with them is to make membrillo. And if anybody's tasted membrillo, oh my God, I love it. It's, um, I think it's Spanish or Portuguese. Or, yeah, I think Spanish or Portuguese. But traditionally, you would make up this quince paste and you would have it with a cheese like um, mm. one of those hard cheeses, uh, manchego, manchego cheese. And you would have the, the quince paste on top. Now, it's, this is not for the faint hearted because I'm telling you now, you're going to be stirring the pot for about, oh, an hour, an hour and a half at least uh, before you're, you're anywhere close to being done. Um, but it is so well worth it because it is gorgeous. So that's Membrillo and it is beautiful. And you know something, another thing to do is with these guys, even if you, um, if you don't want to cook with them or you, you haven't time to make Membrillo or whatever, if you take them off the plant and just put them into a bowl in your kitchen, the it's potpourri has nothing on it. They, the smell wafts through the house. It is beautiful, fragrant, floral, fabulous. So even just to use them for your house, oh my God, they're fantastic. But a beautiful plant, really, really beautiful plant. And then finally, guys, finally, uh, we have Sambucus uh, nigra black lace. Now, I'm not sure about everybody else, but my elder flowers are just about gone over. And of course, I have a May champagne, which is really annoying me. Um, but oh, I'll do it next year. Um, I might get lucky and find a, a late flowering elder. But that's particularly, this is, this is the, the black variety of uh, our common elder. And that elder flower you collect now and you make your champagne or you make your syrups. Um, later on, it goes into those beautiful berries and those berries make uh, wonderful syrups again. And of course, using these into winter, these make the most amazing vitamin C. They're so high in vitamin C. They're so good for you coming into the winter. And they're so, you know, from that point of view of protecting your immune system, amazing. God, it's all like, I mean, this is all the stuff we should be doing anyway, but it is amazing now. Now is the time, you know, to be doing something. And then, of course, look at the plant. I mean, you're not even seeing the proper full plant there, but it has this beautiful black um, um, dissected leaf. And if you are in a windy, you know, really, really windy garden and you'd love to grow your acers, but you can't because it's too blinking windy. This is the plant. It is so good from that point of view. It'll give you that lovely kind of fabulous foliage, beautiful pink. And of course, the biggest thing with the champagne, it's not just your ordinary champagne that you would make from your ordinary common elder. It's pink, which is fantastic. Pink champagne. And it does do the same sort of thing. It bubbles up and it's just wonderful. So that is just, um, that's a great plant, an absolute great plant. Um, and I think, yes, so now that's, that's pretty much, that's the plants. That's it. Thank you for sticking with me. And just to show you a couple of things. Now, these are only just a couple because um, I do have a couple of plants that I wanted to just show you before we, we finish up. Uh, but this is, this one is a massaged kale salad. And you can see there are violas and uh, cornflowers and carnations and begonias and calendula and the kitchen sink <laughs> in there. Um, you know, it's just, isn't it so pretty? I mean, it's just so lovely. And they do add that flavor and texture to the kale salad as well. And another one, this is a herb salad. So when I do my salads, again, like that, I could be taking everything from the garden, strawberry leaves, you know, mallow leaves, um, 
um, uh, what else would I put into it? I'm just trying to think. I have Cranberry Cordifolia out there. I take the young leaves of that. Packy Fragma is another one that I use all the time. Um, oh my God, there's heaps of them out there. You know, Cretaceous leaves, beech leaves, anything like that. All the herbs, sweet Sicily, um, all of those fennels, all the rest of it. I take them all together and if you just put them in leaf by leaf into the salad, sometimes they're too much. They're too overpowering in a salad. So what I do is with all of the, the leaves, I just I bunch them up together and then I cut them. I serrate them so that you're getting strands of flavor rather than this overwhelming mint leaf in your mouth. You know, you're just getting a little flavor of mint into it. And then, of course, add your flowers into it. And you can see there's um, pansies uh, or violas. They're violas. There's mallow flowers. There's cranberry cordifolia flowers there. There's nasturtiums. And is there anything else? I think that's it on, the, on that particular one, which is lovely. And, of course, throw a bit of fruit into. <laughs> can't be without a bit of fruit in a salad. And then here's another one, same sort of thing. It's a um, herb salad, same idea. You serrate it all up. But now you can see uh, dahlia flowers in there. You can see begonia flowers. You can see phasalis. We grow phasalis down in Wendy's. And uh, phasalis are the Cape gooseberries, you know, the little ones that come in their lanterns and then they're left with these gorgeous yellow berries inside. Um, and they're lovely in a salad as well. Um, and there, it's just, it's just so pretty, and so the textures and flavors are so, so good in it, really, really good. And then, of course, you can't have a blinking cake without having a few flowers on it. So, you know, and you can be as, um, what's the word, as uh, stylish or as godish as mine tend to be gaudy. Mine tend to be gaudy. My sister, one time, I don't know, I don't know if I have the photograph here, but. I did a cake for her and she said it was like one of those hats, those swimming hats from the, you know, the 1940s or 1950s, you know, the big flowery things. It's very mean. I'm not making her cakes anymore. So anyway, on this one, you can see there's violas and there's cornflowers and a little bit of calendula and uh, borage. Borage, of course, geez, I never even mentioned borage, but I'm sure everybody knows about borage at this stage. Borage is a great plant. And chusa is another one. If you like borage, now, Wendy always gives out to me because she adores borage and thinks borage is the best thing. But if it was for me, I would grow and choose that. And there's a lovely one called, I think it's, oh, is it Jack Laden maybe? Or not sure. Lovely cultivar of Anchusa. Anchusa is a beautiful plant. But it, um, it puts on these azure blue flowers and they are glorious and they're edible as well. Um, I think they're better than borage, but anyway, that's that's personal. Uh, pavlovas, can't be without a pavlova. Do you see those berries as well? Those berries are Japanese wine berries. Now, we didn't even talk about those ones. But Japanese wine berries, if you have the space, oh my God, it's a beautiful architectural plant, but they put on these berries that are, oh, they're like nothing else. They're just delicious. They also hold a texture. They're not like raspberries that kind of squish. These hold their texture, but they're incredibly sweet and beautiful. And you can see there's borage and cornflowers and uh, probably dahlia. Or maybe maybe that is actually um, um, begonia in there as well. Uh, oh, sorry. This is the, this is the swimming hack cake. <laughs> I think it's very stylish. I don't know what she's talking about. But anyway, you can see, oh, I think that one there, if you can see it, if you can see that one, um, that's Anchusa. And then uh, there are carnations, carnations, pinks, if anybody knows pinks, absolutely glorious. They, they you know, they, they smell and taste of cinnamon or cloves, cloves probably more like it. Um, uh, what else is there? The lovely violas, uh, cornflowers. You can see I put cornflowers on everything, but they're fabulous. Cornflowers are amazing. And is that it then? I think that might be the last one. Oh, it's frozen now on me, but I think it is. Uh, you want me to uh, stop the share? Yeah, maybe. Oh no, actually, do you know what? Can we just, can I show uh, everybody some plants before? This will be really, really quickly just to show you. Is that okay, Marianne? Oh yeah, I was just thinking then you'll be full screen rather than this. Oh yeah, yes, you're right. Yes, would you do that? 
Yeah. And I'll get these plugs. Now, can you see this one, folks? Wait, I see now. This beautiful plant is a plant called Calicanthus or the spice tree. And it is Calicanthus floridus. It is incredible. It is really, really good plant. You can see it. It's, it's a really nice shrub, mid-sized shrub. And uh, it has the most beautiful flowers. They're only just starting to come out now. Oh, that's too low down. Sorry, guys. It's only starting to come out with these beautiful flowers that are incredibly fragrant, really, really fragrant. But the funny little story about this one, it's not the leaves and the flowers are poisonous. You don't eat those. It's actually the stem. So you take the stem and you take the bark off the stem and you add that, you use that like you would cinnamon. And it's it is very, very good. So again, if you're trying to do local food and you're trying to stay away from, you know, you're trying to do all of your spices and your whatever's from, from plants that you can have locally in your own garden, these, th this is a really good one. This will give you that sort of spicy, cinnamony flavor. But the funny little story with this one is locally it was called, and I can't remember where it's local to, I think it's, oh, I'll only be guessing, so I'm not going to say, but um, they call it the booby tree or the booby plant. And why they call it that is because the women would take the flowers when they're in full flower. Now, this one is only just starting to come out and it's incredibly fragrant, but they would put it in their cleavage and the, the, the combination of the wonderful volatile oils in the, in the flower and of course body heat would have them smelling beautifully for the whole day. So that's where it got its name, booby tree. <laughs> But that is a lovely plant and I, oh my God, I got that in a local garden and oh, Carolina Allspice, that's the common name for it, Carolina Allspice. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous plant. So that's going down to Wendy's garden. And then here is another cute, this one, if you can see it, oh God, yeah. can you see that? This is a wonderful, I can even smell it from here. It's called Society Garlic uh, Tulbagia, if anybody knows that plant, Tulbagia. And um, it basically, it's, it's not in the Allium family, but it does the same sort of job. All of those flowers there have a wonderful garlicky flavor, but they're, they're um, you know, they're not quite as strong as garlic. So if you wanted to put them into salads, you could easily do it without overpowering it. Um, but Talbagias come in pinks and purples. And this is a beautiful one that I got from Seamus up in Donegal, um, Cluntor uh, Gardens. He, I mean, he's an amazing grower up there. But it, look, it's kind of like a, I don't know if that even comes out on the, the camera. It's sort of like a mauvey, brownie color. It's really unusual. Um, and of course, you can use the leaves as well, like you would chive leaves. Um, but it's the flowers that are the best bit. So that's Talbagia, which is great. Uh, next thing we have is, this was the beautiful rose that I was telling you about. See the Rosa Rugosa, uh, which is a great, great, very strong, vigorous. And can you see the flowers are just starting to come out on it, which is a really good one. But you can see it's a good, big, healthy. And that one is Rosary, Rosary, Rosary Rosaria. Rosaria de la Haye, Rosaria de la Haye, I think. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but somewhere in along there. And then we have eryngiums. Now the eryngiums are sea hollies, the same family, all that same family. And eryngiums, you can eat those young leaves, you can eat the roots, um, but they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. They're a great plant. Um, they're just gorgeous. They're lovely, lovely to have. And they really will take up a kind of a difficult space as well. And then and this one, I just have to show it to you because this is, uh, oh my God, gone out of my head. Um, it's basically, it's a ginger, but it's the ornamental ginger, which I can't think of its name. What the hell do you call it? Um, so it's not the ginger that we use for root ginger. 
Uh, you can eat the root ginger as well, but it's actually the flower. I'll think of its name now in two minutes. Isn't that desperate? Jesus, this is what age is doing to me. Can't remember anything anymore. Um, and then just to give you um, a few other little pieces, just, uh, these were just from the garden. So we have uh, Achilles, all Achilles, great plants, lovely, a great healing herb as well. Um, uh, roses, again, like I said, all roses. Scented geraniums. I mean, you can't be without a scented geranium in, in your garden. It's so good and amazing for syrups and for baking and for loads of different things. Um, we have Nepita, Nepita cat mint, you know, the one the cats all got bananas for. Um, oh, the smell is wonderful. But again, a tea made from Nepita is wonderful. It's really good. You can, of course, use the flowers in salads and all the rest. It's, it's grand. Um, strong, you just, again, even hand with it. And Acamilla Mollus, you know Acamilla Mollus, um, uh, Lady's Mantle. I mean, it's great when it's not so great for eating, but it's a lovely herb. It's a really good herb and it's such a good plant. And uh, then I think that's it. The only other little one that I just wanted, the last one just to show you, is my little baby. <laughs> if you can see that. I have a thing about nettles. So anything that looks like a nettle, is, it's, it's going in my garden. I can guarantee you. Um, this is a beautiful family of plants called Boherias, and they do look like nettles. This particular one is Boheria tricuspidata, uh, or tricuspis, tricuspis, and it does have these wonderful kind of, you know, those, those, those inferences, you know, the, the nettle-like flowers on it, uh, will make seed as well. But again, this whole family, are, they're very, very useful. You can use them as a green, but to be honest, they're particularly useful for making like our fiber plant. So you would make, um, uh, they're used in the clothing industry. In China, they're actually grown on mass for, for, for fiber for clothing. Um, but they're just beautiful. And I have now got about, I think of about six different types of Boherias and they're all going down to Wendy's. So they finally have a place where they can actually get big and look fabulous. Can you see the red stems on it? It really is a gorgeous plant. Gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Um, but that's very good. And then, of course, the only other little one I had here is just Agastache or Anise Hyssop. You can't go wrong without Agastache. It's so easy to grow and such a lovely plant. And the leaves are edible, the flowers are edible, everything. You know, it's, it's a good one to have. So that's it, folks. <laughs> I got, you're so good to stay with me. I mean, it's long enough. It's, and I can be an awful waffler at times, I have to tell you. I oh, can't hear you, Marianne. Helps if I unmute myself. That was fabulous. That was really, really enjoyable. Uh, Thank you. Whistle stop tour. Whistle stop tour. Yeah, and I'm telling you, it's a tiny tip of what, what's out there. Like, it really is. You could go, I could go on for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and bore you all silly, is all I can say. No, it was lovely. Thank you. And I think there's various questions coming up over it and then... I think if people want to take the time to ask some questions now, sure, absolutely. either put them in chat or they can unmute themselves and speak. I'm just going to stop the recording though, just at this point. Brilliant.